Hello, I'm Norman Swan. Welcome to this program on breathlessness in the older adult, asking the question, is it asthma? We're coming to you live across Australia through the Rural Health Education Foundation satellite network. Some older people think that breathlessness is a natural consequence of ageing, unaware that's not the case. Even though the prevalence of asthma and chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, COPD, both increase with age. In this program, we'll talk about the differential diagnosis of breathlessness with special reference to asthma and COPD. You see, the distinction between asthma and COPD is important, even when they coexist, as there are significant differences in the care of people with each condition. As always, we have a number of useful resources available for you on the Rural Health Education Foundation's website, rhef.com. Au. As usual, the broadcast is interactive and we want your phone calls and faxes whenever you want to ask a question or you can even drop us an email. We've already had one question in ahead of time and we look forward to yours. The numbers to call in on are 1-800-817-268 or if you're phoning from Sydney, it's 9715-8715. Fax numbers, 1-800-633-410 or 9715-8700 from the Sydney area. Or you can drop us an email and somebody will be hanging on the computer waiting for it. Questions at rhef.com.au. Now let's meet our panel. Christine MacDonald is Deputy Director of the Austin Hospital's Department of Respiratory and Sleep Medicine and a Director of the Institute for Breathing and Sleep Medicine at the institu same institution. Welcome, Christine. Thanks very much. As a clinician researcher, Christine's special research interests include airways diseases, asthma, COPD and lung cancer, and she's a member of the Australian Lung Foundation COPD executive. Gary Kilov is a solo general practitioner, currently practicing in Clorinda in Melbourne, with over 25 years experience in both metropolitan and regional practice. Welcome, Gary. Thank you. Tony Riley is a community pharmacist with 30 years experience, currently practicing in Bendigo, Victoria. A Victorian evening this evening. Welcome, Tony. Thank you. Tony is, uh, has a major focus in her pharmacy, is the provision of pharmacy services to residential care facilities, and is also the, on the National Asthma Council Pharmacist Asthma Group. And last but not least, Vanessa McDonald, who's a respiratory and sleep medicine clinical nurse consultant with Hunter New England Health in Newcastle, in New South Wales and has 15, ex 15 years experience in asthma and respiratory education. Welcome Vanessa. Thanks Norman. Vanessa's current PhD studies are in obstructive airways disease in older people. Sounds like uh, you know her special interests tonight are in mastermind so we'll sit back and have the spotlight <laughs> going on you all. Welcome to you all though. Now what do you think are the major issues here from general practice point of view Gary? I think we uh, see a number of patients who may present with uh, shortness of breath or some respiratory symptom and uh, the issue is really to try and tease out uh, the potential causes, the uh, uh, differential diagnosis and then to stratify those in terms of potential seriousness and potential urgency. Common walk-in though isn't it? It is indeed and uh, it may often be an, even an incidental um, finding uh, when somebody presents with something else. So they may present with uh, an upper respiratory tract infection and when one uh, delves a little bit deeper into the history they may explain that um, you know they routinely need several courses of antibiotics, uh, they get more frequent infections than, uh, than, than other people and it's something that we can then explore further. Do you often get a surprise diagnosis when you go through the differential, one you didn't expect? We do, we do indeed and I think particularly with the elder patient, with the older patient um, uh, because the uh, existence often of, of uh, multiple diagnoses, multiple pathology, uh, even if one is fairly certain about one diagnosis, one has to be vigilant not to miss something else. By the time you get down to the back of the pharmacy, a few of them must be breathless, Tony. You're probably correct, but uh, not too often do we... Your head's buried in the computer screen, you wouldn't know. Oh, no, not at all. <laughs> But I think that, you know, the reality is that we do get the odd breathless patient in the pharmacy that perhaps hasn't been to the doctor at that stage. Um, and it would be our normal procedure that we would endeavour to make sure that person was seen by the doctor. And maybe we might even ring the doctor first and ensure that that was facilitated for them. If it was urgent, obviously we'd be calling an ambulance and sending them off to the hospital. What are the common medication issues from your point of view? Well, I, as in drug interaction type things, you're thinking mm. along the lines. Um, 
I guess one of the things that we need to be very careful about is beta blockers and people with asthma and not only beta blockers treating cardiovascular conditions but beta blockers that they're using for in eye drops that oftentimes ophthalmologists don't get to know the rest of their condition so they may not know that this is a contraindication for that particular person. You mean there is another part of the body than the eye? There is, yes, <laughs> yes. Vanessa, you imagine these days where smoking rates, particularly in the over 50s, are incredibly low, that the problems of COPD, etc., and asthma must be disappearing. Well, we're certainly seeing a decreasing trend in asthma admissions um, into the acute setting. However, we're not seeing the same trend with COPD admissions. And the prevalence of asthma and COPD in this country and internationally is, in fact, increasing. Really? Mm hmm. Christine, why aren't the rates going down? Well, certainly in COPD, it's, um, we're seeing people in the older age group who, um, of course, is a, a started off as a cohort who might have been smokers, so we're still seeing the effects of the smoking down the track. Uh, in terms of asthma and COPD in the older age group, uh, as we're here to talk about tonight, it quite, can be quite difficult to tease out one from the other, particularly if they have been smokers. And even although you said smoking rates are going down, smoking rates among asthmatics um, you know, not dissimilar from the rest of the community. So still around the sort of 20% or 17 to 20%. So um, th that's why I think we're still seeing people being admitted to hospital with COPD and asthma in the older age group because probably many of them have coexistent disease. And um, I understand that the asthma deaths these days are in the yes, older age group. Yes, they, they are. And again, uh, that may be partly to do with that, that uh, part of that may be that they're, that they're actually COPD patients, partly to do with the fact that we're underdiagnosing asthma in the COP in, sorry, in the elderly population. Why is that? Um, possibly not thinking of it as much. Um, and in fact, there's data to suggest that, that uh, patients who are older may not be tested or may, uh, the, the diagnosis may not be thought of as much as in a younger person. Um, there's also diagnostic um, uh, well, there's male-female discrepancy, I suppose. If you see a, a woman presenting with breathlessness, you're more likely to think of asthma. If you see an um, older man, you're more likely to think of COPD, whereas that doesn't always follow. So there's a burden of underdiagnosed COPD as well? Under, un undoubtedly there is, yes. And have people done the epidemiology of the mixed picture, and even if you add in coronary heart disease? Not very well, Norman. In fact, um, that hasn't been done very well. And I think a lot of the epidemiology, um, the asthma prevalence and the COPD prevalence, there's probably an interaction between the two. Um, there, has been, uh, uh, there have been some papers looking at the number of patients who are co-diagnosed with both asthma and COPD and this is quite high mm. and of course patients themselves will say well one doctor told me I had asthma the other one said I had emphysema what have I got doctor and often it is quite difficult to tease that out and they may have both. And is there an inordinate focus on the heart do you think being a mm, respiratory yes, physician? Yes I do think so. Uh, well as a, you know, as a hospital um, specialist of course we see the patients they've normally had the, um, the investigations for the, for the cardiac disease so they've had their echocardiogram they've had their ECG uh, and then someone, someone thinks, oh, well, maybe, maybe they should have some, a breathing test. Yeah, and the penny drops. And maybe maybe yeah. it's not that. Do you find that out there as well, Vanessa? Yes. And I, it, in fact, the prevalence of this overlap in this mixed disease is, um, is I think, it being increasingly recognised. There was actually a paper this, um, this month in Thorax from a group in New Zealand that studied a large group of people with airways disease and they found that only 19% could be definitively um, defined as COPD alone. The rest of the population had some kind of overlap whether it be asthma and COPD or whether that be chronic bronchitis, emphysema or um, some other kind of mix. Which Gary must complicate the management. Absolutely. Um, I know this is a respiratory evening but as a GP uh, we I'm perhaps defending the cardiac perspective a little bit. Mm. Uh, we know that that so cardiovascular we're, we're death. We're holistic here. Uh, <laughs> we can talk your heart. And cardiovascular death certainly is still, um, yeah. mm. and despite all the advances that have occurred, is, is, it still takes the lion's share of, of mortality. And, uh, and and I guess there is a mindset among GPs that if there is a possibility of this being cardiac, um, that's that that's going to be the focus. And to some extent, as, as you mentioned, we, we, we don't think about it enough, COPD enough, uh, and, and the risk factors or the uh, um, uh, pathogenesis of some of these conditions overlap. And uh, once, they've, once the GP has perhaps uh, uh, excluded 
uh, what they perceive might be a cause of, of sudden death or, or, or of much greater urgency, um, sometimes the, uh, the, the drive to continue the, to explore the causes is, uh, is lessened and, uh, and hopefully uh, this evening we can change that a little bit. Well, let's try. We've got a few case studies for you tonight. Let's take a look at our first one. Max is a 65-year-old man, new to your surgery, uh, Gary, you've never seen him before, and he comes in complaining of increasing breathlessness with some activities, finding it a bit harder going to the shops, climbing stairs, walking any distance. He isn't too worried because, you know, he says to you he's not as young as he used to be. What's your approach to Max? Yeah, th th this is a fairly common scenario. Um, a patient who presents new to the practice, they may have moved into the area, or their GP may have retired, and... Um, and they'll often minimise these symptoms because they've been coming on over uh, sometimes decades. Um, they'll attribute it to, to ageing, to uh, perhaps putting on a little bit of weight or uh, giving up the golf. Um, and, um, and, and because it's insidious, uh, people are able to adjust remarkably well to their declining lung function. From the GP's perspective, you have really undifferentiated disease. So, um, we're looking broadly, I suppose, at, uh, we've already alluded to cardiac causes, um, respiratory causes, and of course there's an overlap um, of, of both. And then of course there are the non-cardiac, non-respiratory causes, such as perhaps anemia, um, uh, uh, even anxiety. Uh, we are seeing more and more of our patients becoming obese and deconditioned. So uh, it, it, it can be a little bit difficult to tease out on the basis, certainly, of the limited information we have at present. Anything to add to the differential diagnosis, Christine, what are we thinking about? No, I, I just think your yeah, thyroid disease, I suppose, you know, there's a, there's a bit of a dif differential, and I guess in terms of respiratory diseases, there are also other respiratory diseases, which, such as pulmonary fibrosis. I mean, much rarer, but uh, again, uh, in terms of your differential with cardiac disease as well, with crackles, yeah. for example. Yeah. So if you actually go into Max's uh, history, he's had a, you know, he seems to have had a run of upper respiratory infections, but he tells you he was always a bit of a chesty child. Um, and he does talk about wheezing and coughing, particularly um, on exercise first thing in the morning. And he um, is uh, mildly obese with a BMI of 30. He's taking half an aspirin a day from his advice of his last doctor and a torvastatin 20 milligrams daily. Between the ages of 17 and 50, he smoked a pack a day and he says that he's now an ex-smoker. Um, he tells you that his last doctor did an ultrasound of his heart, but uh, he's never had a lung test. So what are you going to do for him now? Yes, the, um, I guess this uh, focuses our attention a little bit on uh, more on the respiratory side. He's had some of the uh, cardiological investigations, although there's, there's certainly room for more. Um, he would have, the, the, the previous GP would have excluded things like heart failure perhaps, but uh, there could still be silent ischemia. Um, we would like to do some other investigations looking at anemia, and of course we would like to do spirometry. So anybody who presents with any respiratory symptom, I believe, uh, should have spirometry, and, and certainly Max would be a candidate for that. And presumably a chest x-ray looking for a tumour? Yes, a chest x-ray as well. Um, and uh, Is it going to tell you much else other than a tumour? Christine, I mean, the, the reason for an X-ray in a man like this? Ah, well, I guess if you see a major degree of hyperinflation, you're going to be thinking you could be thinking asthma or COPD. Um, you'll be looking for cardiac size, as you say, um, but tumour, no other than no. And, mm -hmm. and pulmonary fibrosis. But you would have found that on examination. You would have found some crackles. So this is presuming we've sort of skipped over examination, but um, presuming that you, you find have laid a hand much. on him, Gary. Or? <laughs> oh, absolutely. Presuming that there's not much to find. Yeah. Um, Gary, what's your view of the role of spirometry in general practice? I think spirometry is very important. Um, in a situation like this, it can give us an enormous amount of information and can possibly obviate the need for more complicated and expensive investigations. Uh, it's, um, it's an effective way of picking up obstructive lung disease. We can also pick up restriction, which, which as Christine says, is less, less common. Um, it'll also help us in terms of uh, defining the severity of the disease, if there is any. It's a good baseline to uh, uh, determine the response of medication too. So uh, if there's an improvement, we can also track the pro progression of the disease as well. So uh, I think spirometry is, is, is an absolutely essential part of any respiratory um, uh, history and examination. An essential part of general practice. I mean, some people, Christine, have argued that if you've got a, if you've got a stethoscope in general practice, you should have a spirometer. 
I think I think spirometry. Do, I mean. Diagnosing respiratory disease without doing respirometry is a bit like you know, managing diabetes without looking at the blood sugar, as far as I'm concerned. But I am a respiratory physician. But no, I, th I think we, we need to be doing more of it in general practice. And I mm -hmm. So how, what are you looking for on the spirometry, Christine, to differentiate here w between, uh, say, asthma or COPD and someone like Max? So we're looking for, for, for airflow obstruction to diagnose either of them. Now in, in asthma, of course, uh, there's variability and reversibility uh, of airflow obstruction and certainly um, uh, in most patients that reversibility is complete. So uh, post bronchodilator you'll get normal spirometry. In COPD, by, def by its definition, you have a, a, an irreversible or poorly reversible degree of airflow obstruction and the post bronchodilator spirometry will still show a persisting obstructive defect. Vanessa, what would be the issues, just if you're thinking ahead and dealing with Max, you'd want to, in terms of self-management and other things, that you'd want to be preparing yourself for or preparing him for? Well, I guess with Max, this, despite whether this might be asthma or COPD, it will be a new diagnosis. So he's going to need to understand the process of the disease um, and how it's managed in terms of the action of these medications, the side effects that might happen and how they're delivered because most likely they're going to be inhaled medications. So that would be the um, first things that we would need to deal with with Max. He has been a past smoker so I think we'd need to revisit whether or not he um, is currently smoking or has been smoking recently. Um, just because someone smoked previous, uh, gave up previously doesn't mean that they're still a current smoker. Whether Max is diagnosed with asthma or COPD, I guess then we'd need to look at whether or not he'd need some exercise rehabilitation. As um, Gary said, he's deconditioned, he's overweight. Um, so that would be an effective form of treatment for him with his um, decreased lung function. That's if he has decreased lung function after we do the spirometry. Um, and the final thing would be developing some kind of management plan with him so that he knows what to do should his symptoms deteriorate. And Christine, is there any evidence that reducing weight improves respiratory symptoms in asthma or CP COPD? There is limited evidence, Norman, uh, that, is the ca that that is the case, yes, but it has, it's very difficult to get people to lose weight, so in fact the studies are quite difficult to do. We certainly know from the sleep apnea world that uh, whenever we try and do such studies, uh, um, the majority of patients actually don't lose the weight, but certainly I would agree with you that an exercise program and weight reduction program would be a very important part of this man's management. Although often with COPD you're thin rather than fat. Mm. Oftentimes. And, and well, so that used to be the case, although we're finding now, uh, you know, with the so obesity uh, epidemic that's also So you're getting the same paradox you get in heart failure, and heart failure, you're more likely to get heart failure if you're obese, but if you, once you're obese, you're more likely to survive it. Do you want to add? Sorry. Yes. <laughs> uh, certainly in COPD, there is that obesity paradox in that um, if you're obese, you're protected against mortality. Mm. Um, and many of the studies have shown that, so it's difficult to know what to do in that situation, I suppose. Is there much difference in symptomatology between, say, somebody who's in their 30s or 40s versus Max who's in his late 60s? In terms of... Uh, asthma or C well, COPD, you're not going to really expect in the younger person, but asthma? I think, I think, it's, um, I think if the person is, is uh, younger, um, it's usually more clear-cut clear -cut that they have asthma, and so, uh, but, th but the symptoms will be the same. Um, but in this particular instance, the, the patient's main symptom is breathlessness. In the younger age group, certainly, you know, teens and, and children and younger adults, I think we'll probably see wheeze more f frequently uh, rather than the insidious onset of breathlessness. Uh, it's the, the older patient who doesn't attribute or who attributes this to just the ageing process that we see commonly, whereas uh, younger people would be usually more energetic, doing more exercise, and this is not normal, so they'll go along perhaps earlier. So Gary, let's assume for the moment that Max is um, pure COPD, the one in five, the 20% who've got COPD rather than the mixed picture. How would you manage him? It would be important to uh, quantify the degree of obstruction and uh, uh, that would determine, I suppose, the choice of medication. So if he had mild COPD, we may find that um, simple uh, PRN use of a bronchodilator, short-acting bronchodilator, may be enough. Even um, if there's not much reversibility? 
Yes, it has been shown to improve exercise tolerance and um, quality of life. Um, if he was perhaps a little more severe, we might add a, a long-acting um, bronchodilator such as tritropium. And if he was getting into the more moderate to severe um, level, we might then add inhaled steroids and perhaps a, a long-acting beta agonist combination. And the role of antibiotics? The role of antibiotics, I think, is important in intercurrent infection. It can be difficult, though, to differentiate between um, an acute a, exacerbation, an, an acute ex uh, yeah, yeah. And, and, and also viral versus um, bacterial, because even with a viral infection, they may cough up um, discoloured sputum. But we do know that um, that untreated uh, intercurrent infection does, in fact, further damage the lungs. So. Uh, early and, and aggressive appropriate management is important with antibiotics. Anything to add or change, Christine? Uh, just while we're talking on the antibiotic question, I suppose um, depending on how much sputum this man has, I mean, another, another differential that we haven't discussed is bronchiectasis and um, quite a large number of patients with COPD when you, when you go on to do HRCTs may have bronchiectasis, so that's just muddying the water a little bit, but I think we, we haven't mentioned it and we should because it's... Um, and if there was bronchiectasis, um, maybe well, chest I think physio? I, or? Chest physiotherapy would be posturing and uh, flutter valves and, um, and again prompt use of antibiotics for infections. And would you change anything to Gary's management? No, I don't think so. Um, just uh, we uh, or, already, Vanessa's mentioned the pulmonary re rehabilitation, but I think that's really important to emphasise. Um, in, in this man and in all patients with COPD, pulmonary rehabilitation is level one evidence to support its use in terms of improvement in exercise capacity and quality of life and potentially also uh, some reduction in hospital admissions. And um, as far as my understanding through the uh, Lung Foundation's work, uh, about 2% of patients with COPD in Australia has access to uh, pulmonary rehab, so it's really inadequate. And I guess the message should be that um, there's a toolkit available on the Australian Lung Foundation website and people who are interested uh, can go to that. And, and obviously in the rural community, we need to be thinking about groups, setting up groups uh, to assist these patients as well as uh, it's easy in, the, in, in Melbourne or Sydney. But, yeah. Vanessa? Absolutely, I agree. I mean, the access that people have to rehab is appalling, really, when you look at the population. Um, and but it's I, the sort of stuff that a local physio or OT could get involved mm. with. It's not that complicated, it's just doing it. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, the, the pulmonary rehabilitation programs that combine exercise together with, um, with self-management are those that have been shown to be the most effective. And doing that in a local community centre um, is in, easy enough to do if you've got the resources, I suppose. And adherence is pretty important, Tony. Absolutely. I think probably from the pharmacist's perspective, understanding what disease this patient actually has is really important. And oftentimes we're not privy with that diagnosis, so that makes it a little bit difficult for pharmacists. But going through the adherence process well, program really with the patient making sure they know how to use their devices and understand why and what they're doing is really important and it is we we probably see them more than anyone else does so it's an opportunity and a question from a uh, general practitioner in rural victoria uh, to you gary what would, would be the recommended antibiotic for acute exacerbations i'd probably look at a um, combination of uh, amoxicillin and clavulinic acid and uh, we know that, that uh, there's an increasing incidence of atypical organisms, so to, we, one may consider macrolide as well. So either if the uh, initial response isn't adequate or sometimes in combination. Do you agree with that, Tony? It's certainly what we see in practice, I must admit. But I guess That's a diplomatic answer. No, <laughs> it's a true, honest answer. I think the thing that we see a lot in practice with older patients being put on those particular groups of antibiotics is the resultant diarrhoea, which is a bit of an issue. So then you've got the compliance problem. So what happens next? Maybe they just stop taking the antibiotics and don't tell anybody, or maybe they do stop taking the antibiotics and go back to their doctor and get something else. But that is a bit of an issue we see quite frequently. Christine, the antibiotic question? Uh, well, I suspect Gary is thinking about that they may have a, a patch of uh, pneumonia and I think that combination therapy would be very appropriate in that situation. But if it's a, if it's a simple bronchitic illness, then I think probably uh, some ruide or some amoxicillin might, might be enough. Uh, and a question from a GP in Queensland asks, um, 
Is, to what, how often would you repeat respirometry in somebody with, say, COPD to look at whether or not you're maintaining or declining? Yes, look, I think that's, there's, there's no level one evidence for that. So this is really level four, you know. Um, We're getting expert, your opinion ex, now. Ex, expert opinion, yes. Um, and I think that uh, I would be, be repeating it uh, firstly um, in terms of uh, a trial of medication in someone that I might suspect um, has coexistent asthma, for example, where I'm expecting to see a significant improvement. And otherwise, probably um, if the patient is not doing well and uh, the breathlessness is deteriorating despite my best attempts, um, to see whether there's any significant change in spirometric indices. In fact, actually, though, interestingly enough, um, spirometry doesn't correlate very well with level of dyspnea in, uh, well, in COPD in general. Uh, so oftentimes um, an MRC breathlessness score or something like that or a quality of life score might be more useful to monitor the patient. So a GP in Adelaide asks, uh, not Adelaide, South Australia asks, what, a, what about um, you think there's coexisting coronary heart disease, you want to do a stress test to see if you can elicit significant ischemia but there's COPD as well. How do you get through all that to actually not muddy up the stress test? Uh, well in that case you, you're often using um, a dobutamine stress test or something like that because you can't exercise the patient enough. Uh, what we do in our hospital is we do a combined a cardiopulmonary exercise test where we we use a cycle ergometer uh, so we've got cardiac response, we're looking at ECG and we can also look at what's happening to ventilation so that can that can give a very nice picture of what's happening to both so the lungs and the thing. heart. But yeah, it's a specialist thing. Um, but in terms of a stress test, um, uh, dibutamine stress tests are uh, the way to go if the patient cannot exert themselves. Do you have any comment, Gary? I agree, absolutely. Let's go to our next case study. And remember, keep those questions coming in. Andrew's 55 years old. He presents with breathlessness. There's no past history of asthma, but he's been a smoker for 41 pack years. Uh, let's have a look at his baseline pulmonary function test. Do you want to walk us through these, uh, Christine? Sure. Well, firstly, on the left-hand side, I'm sure many of you are very familiar with uh, spirometric uh, indices, but just to go through them, the forced expiratory volume in one second, uh, the forced vital capacity, which is the amount of air that you can take in and fully breathe out, the vital capacity, which is done uh, not as a forced manoeuvre but as a slow manoeuvre, um, the forced expiratory ratio, which is the ratio of the forced expiratory volume over vital capacity and then in this particular case we've also got a measure of gas exchange capacity the TLCO or carbon monoxide diffusing capacity and what you can see is that he's got very severe airflow obstruction so he's got an FEV1 of uh, less than a litre 25 percent I think it is of uh, predicted uh, there's an improvement post bronchodilator so it's post MDI probably salbutamol I imagine um, but, you're, but he's left with a significant persisting obstructive ventilatory defect even post bronchodilator. So um, looking like COPD, particularly with that uh, gas exchange abnormality, but still could be asthma. There's a 27% improvement um, in uh, FEV1 post bronchodilator, which is only a couple of hundred mils. So I think it's right on the borderline there, but you'd be looking, I think, about thinking about COPD. What would you do for him, Gary? Um, it, as, as Christine's mentioned, you, you're really trying to tease out whether this is um, COPD or asthma or probably a combination of both, given that there has been a reasonable amount of reversibility. Um, I would <clears throat> look at, at perhaps a, a steroid challenge, either oral steroids, perhaps prednisolone 25 milligrams a day for four weeks, or um, inhaled steroids. And to some extent, the choice would depend on how symptomatic the patient is. Um, and I would then repeat the spirometry and see w you know, whether we were able to achieve significant uh, improvement. What would you do, Christine, with him? I think I'd do exactly the same thing. Oral steroids, though, or inhaled? Um, well, you know what, Norman? I know this patient, and I know that I gave him oral steroids, but, uh, and this particular patient was really quite unwell. So I think I take uh, Gary's point that uh, in a particularly unwell person, probably oral to try and get that response fairly quickly. So let's see what his pulmonary function tests were um, after three weeks. Christine? Well, I'm delighted to say that there's been a significant improvement in the FEV1. So remembering that it was under a litre uh, in the previous uh, uh, graph uh, or table, um, and we now are 2.4 litres, which is 68% of predicted normal. So a significant improvement uh, in baseline uh, ventilatory function with a forced expiratory ratio post bronchodilator now 
um, of 66%. So he still has uh, a persisting degree of airflow obstruction, but really uh, an asthmatic type response, I would say, to this uh, course of prednisolone. So it's a mixed picture? It's a mixed picture in that he still has a persisting degree of airflow obstruction um, even after our maximal treatment. So Gary, how are you going to manage him going forward? And he's, on his oral, he's on oral steroids, you've got a good response, he's ready to run a marathon, except it would have to be a pretty limited one given his COPD. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, I would uh, certainly look to transfer him onto inhaled steroids and uh, probably in combination with a long-acting beta agonist. Um, this fellow has quite si significant asthma. Uh, he's probably got remodelling from, uh, either remodelling from, from under or treated or untreated asthma, but he's also, of course, a smoker, so um, uh, he's got the double whammy. Um, How are you going to get him off his smoking? Ah, oh, I wish I knew the, the, the answer. Um, I think one of the things that I find works is really to show him the result of his spirometry. Uh, I find that quite powerful because you can show the patient what they achieved and this is the best that you could do, this is what you should be doing, this is as a result of your smoking. There's randomised controlled trial evidence to suggest that actually telling them their lung age makes a difference to motivating them. Yes and, and, and quite a number of the spirometers now include that uh, as an option in the printout. So, it, so it you can have 85 year old lungs, Andrew. <laughs> yes, and this is one of the rare situations where we can actually wind time backwards. We can actually get your lungs younger. It's not, we can't often offer that. Tony, what are the PBS issues here in terms of um, Andrew moving forward given this transition? Well, given the transition, Initially, the person's going to Andrew's going to need to try just a plain st inhaled steroid brief before he can go on, and that has needs to be successful before the beta agonist can be added into a combination. So, initially, he potentially could be having two inhalers, uh, maybe two different forms. So, a short acting reliever plus the um plus the steroid, the you know your inhaled steroid. And the dose of steroid. Um, well, it'd probably be the 250 microgram type dose, I should think, I would imagine, and I'd have to defer to my respiratory physician and GP, of course, but it'd be, you know, starting low. Um, well, no, probably he'd be starting higher at that stage, wouldn't he, because he's been on his oral. So it does depend a bit on what the physicians are feeling at this stage, but from the pharmacist's perspective, there's a whole lot of other issues around compliance and understanding the disease state and and you know the willingness to treat, especially in a younger person, the willingness to treat and accept that that's essential is often the challenge that we're faced and I should imagine people like Vanessa deal with every mm. single day. Mm. So just before we come to yeah. Vanessa, what about the doors of endocardial yeah, series? Because uh, well, we're still going too high, aren't we? Yeah. It's high. Um, look, it's, uh, it's difficult, isn't it? Um, if he's purely got asthma, I, I know that we've, we've certainly moved away from those very high doses that used to be used sort of a decade or so ago. On the other hand, if we think he has COPD and we, we mm. know by definition he's got some irreversible airflow obstruction and it's a moot point, isn't it, whether it's the remodelling that you talked about or whether it truly is the COPD, um, you'll be aware that the studies that have been done in COPD have used higher doses fixed doses um, of uh, inhaled corticosteroid and long-acting beta agonist of 1,000 micrograms in the, in the large studies such as the TORCH study um, and uh, 800 micrograms of budesonide in studies by... Um, but that might have been engineered by the pharmaceutical company well, in, or just in, for in war in drug. In indeed so, but the trouble is we have those studies and we don't have the studies of the lower doses in COPD. Whereas in asthma we know that we can use quite low doses of inhaled corticosteroids and that there's a plateau effect. Um, so are you hamstrung by the PBS rules here? If you've got COPD as well as asthma? Um, not necessarily. No, no. no. Right. So, so, but the, the, te the temptation, if you've got a mixed, I'm trying to get the picture of yes. the mixed picture and how that changes your management. So, you know, with titration of dose following the National Asthma Guidelines, the Asthma Action Plans and so on, it's fairly straightforward how you teeter up, teeter down. But with COPD, the teetering down, the titering down might be a, more of an issue. That's right. I think, okay, so thinking about this particular man, I'd be treating him fairly aggressively for his asthma and I'd be probably um, 
wanting to back back titrate. If, however, he was a different patient with severe COPD having recurrent exacerbations, I'd probably be sticking him on a dose of combination therapy and leaving him on that and getting benefit in terms of quality of life and hopefully reductions mm. in exacerbations. So I think those are the those are the differences. So you don't back titrate uh, with COPD for, if you're aiming at reducing hospital admissions in that severe group. Uh, this man's not. Well, he started off severe, but he's, we've, we've converted him to a sort of a mild and moderate. Would, would you expect that lung the spirometry to change much in a month's time? Well, uh, not if he's got COPD. If he's, if he's truly got asthma, and we may see some further benefit, I suppose. Um, and as I know the patient, I should know that, but I can't remember. But um, no, I think, I think his airflow obstruction stayed fairly fixed, so I really truly did believe he had two diseases. So what would you do for him, Vanessa? Well, I think there's a range of different things that Andrew needs. Um, firstly, one of the, the best treatments for someone with COPD or asthma for that matter is to get him to stop smoking. Mm -hmm. So we need to build a partnership with him in terms of getting him to see the things that he needs to do in order to change his behaviour. Um, in terms of his smoking cessation, we'd need to do some counselling, but also offer some pharmacotherapy, um, either in using nicotine replacement therapy or um, some varenicline um, if necessary, and uh, make a commitment to continue to see him in terms of his smoking cessation to provide some support and do referrals to other support lines such as the quit line, etc. Um, but again, with Andrew, this is a new diagnosis and he's come in, he's got a new diagnosis, he's been told to stop smoking, he's been given a um, couple of new devices and um, which will, he needs to make some substantial changes to his behaviour. So he needs to understand why um, and how these treatments are going to work for him and what he will get out of it as well. And we talked briefly about um, ways of getting him to consider stopping smoking. But he's only 55 and if he can see the advances he'll get from stopping smoking now, then that might give him some um, keys to change his smoking behaviour. Um, the Fletcher pedo chart is always very useful when you're trying to get people to stop because they can see the, um, the, the damage that they don't do to their um, lung function by stopping at an earlier age. But it's never too late. <laughs> um, so that's his smoking cessation. Again, if he's got COPD and his TLCO was reduced, mm -hmm. so he would also benefit from some pulmonary rehabilitation. But he does have that element of asthma. So a written action plan for him would be um, effective in terms of avoiding exacerbations, etc. And finally, I mean, we need to just make sure he's using his inhalers correctly. Um, a question uh, from Tasmania asks um, to explain more fully what a pack year is. Ah, one pack year is smoking 20 cigarettes per day for one year. So it's as simple as that. Yeah. So it's intuitively it's what it is. Mm. So um, a question again from Marissa Pill and Querens, is there any truth to, uh, in the need to change the Spiriva machine yearly? Six monthly. Six monthly. Okay. Let's go to our next case study. Denise is 63 and has lived with asthma for most of her adult life. She also has seasonal rhinitis and gastroesophageal reflux. She's on budesonide, 100 micrograms, and ifomoterol, 6 micrograms, on the SMART regime. Tell us what the SMART regime is, uh, Christine. Are we allowed to use drug names here, Norman? We are. We have to in this case. Uh, it's Symbicort used as maintenance and reliever therapy, so the patient would take twice daily Symbicort and then use that as their single, as their reliever as well through the Instead day. Instead of period. a short acting. Correct. But don't you risk getting an overdose of steroids on that? The, the work has been done. In fact, the steroid load seems to be lower in the, in the patient group when SMART was compared to a regular BD plus short acting uh, bronchodilator regimen. So you're, you're effectively treating uh, uh, mini attacks, I suppose, exacerbations of the asthma through the day by uh, nipping them in the bub with the inhaled steroid as well as the bronchodilator. Now she's come in with, uh, Denise has come in with increased uh, breathlessness. What are you going to do for her? The idea of course is to uh, try and ascertain uh, the cause of that. Um, does she have an intercurrent infection? Does she have another diagnosis? Um, is, um, is she using her medication correctly or, or, or at all? 
<coughs> we often uh, find patients uh, discontinuing medications because of something they may have seen on a, a current affair program. Um, so it's a matter of, of teasing out what's changed for the patient. Uh, if, if we assume that, that um, all remains much the same, then you may need to then look at um, other possible uh, confounding factors. And we've spoken about uh, um, some of the things that might aggravate asthma, uh, reflux, uh, rhinitis, um, and these, the, these issues can uh, uh, make the control of the asthma more difficult. Um, even so what are you going to do for her reflux? Well, I think a fairly standard treatment now is, is to introduce a, a proton pump inhibitor. Um, they work quickly, they work effectively. Does it help uh, the asthma? Unfortunately, not always. It can. Mm -hmm. um, uh, reflux can in itself cause respiratory symptoms. It can cause a cough. Uh, it may cause aspiration. So there are a number of mechanisms by which reflux can cause respiratory symptoms. Because you can still have fluid coming up. It's just not as, as acidic with the that, PPI. Th th that's right. So, so if it's volume reflux, you, you, you may have a problem with that and you may need to add a, a prokinetic agent. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but, but we know that patients may develop a cough even if they're not aspirating uh, from, from reflux effect. So, so the question then is, you know, are these symptoms in fact asthma? Um, if, if it is asthma, and this is again uh, where spirometry is, is going to be so useful, if you have serial spirometry, uh, whilst it's useful to compare patients' spirometry results against um, predicted levels or, or against lower limits of normal, it's nowhere near as useful as comparing comparing against comparing it against, against their own performance against themselves and so you know if you find that that the spirometry has not declined you you may be m more uh, inclined to 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 seek uh, other causes on the other hand if there's been a definite uh, increase in the obstruction in you know a deterioration in lung function you're going to be shifting towards uh, concentrating on the respiratory medicine. And what about this rhinitis? Because that could make the asthma worse. A absolutely. And we know that 80% that, uh, of, of people with asthma do have uh, rhinitis. And we also know that uh, uncontrolled rhinitis does make it more difficult to control the asthma. So we would certainly be inclined to treat both. What about the steroid dose if you're starting to treat the rhinitis? Yes, well, um, if you're thinking about the dose, though, it's, it's relatively small, sort of 32 or 64 micrograms compared to what we're talking here in hundreds of micrograms. So it's a relatively small, but yes, you have to think about that. But um, I think, uh, as uh, Gary said, that it's very important to treat the nose so because what, of the improvement. So in what you do with Denise is that you, um, you, give, you, you treat the reflux, you um, give her uh, uh, nasal steroids for her rhinitis, and a month later she's still complaining of increasing breathlessness. What are you going to do now? I think if we've uh, excluded other causes, and, and we spoke uh, in, in the case of Max about, uh, about cardiac pathology and, uh, and, and uh, uh, other non-cardiac and non-respiratory pathology, um, if we've excluded those, then I think the important thing would be to look at uh, what's changed, um, what, what's causing this deterioration, and maybe something as simple as, as the patient um, uh, not using their medication correctly, uh, losing some coordination. Um, so what, what you decide to do is try and increase the dose because you think you can't really find anything. But um, she comes back and Tony, she's just not taking the medication because she's getting thrush. Yeah, no, She I complains to you. She's not, she doesn't like to upset Dr. Kilo because no. he's trying so hard. <laughs> <laughs> and look, sometimes that is a reality. The other reality is too with the, the nasal... Um, steroids of course they are not covered by the PBS so ultimately the person has to wear the cost of that medication and more often, well not more often but commonly we find our elderly patients aren't all that happy about paying a significant amount of money or just don't have that spare money to pay for that so choose not to use it but of course they don't want to bother the doctor with that because the doctor you know thinks that the doctor wants them to have it and they just assume that everything will go on but the, the oral thrush is, is a, a significant problem and is quite commonly told to us in the pharmacy um, and it's about technique obviously it's about treating that for them we would usually drop the drop a line to the doctor and let them know look this particular person's had that problem this is what we've done because it's over the counter um, and recommended um, a better way of using as not 
the proper way of using their inhaler, their steroid inhaler, to make sure that they rinse their mouth out and spit out the, the water after they've rinsed. What about drug interactions? You alluded to the beta blocker drops earlier and so on. What other drug interactions do you need to be wary well, of? I guess, especially in our older patients, oftentimes they're taking medication for arthritis or rheumatism, so they may well be taking non anti-inflammatory. And in a select group of people, that will have, an, you know, cause an exacerbation of their asthma. They're probably our biggest group of drugs, so we really need to be mindful of the eye drops. Um, we need to be mindful of the, the, you know, aches and pains that people suffer. We need to be mindful of the beta blockers that they may well be using for their cardio, cardiovascular problems. So. There are other things, but the other thing, of course, with an older person, we need to be thinking about osteoporosis. That's not an interaction, of course, but it's something else we need to be thinking about, and perhaps it's not our place to prescribe, obviously, but it's certainly our place. You know, if somebody was doing a home medicines review for this patient, that would be something that may well be... So would you do a baseline DEXA on somebody like this, um, Gary? Um, I, again, coming back to the issue of cost, it's it's not PBS reimbursed unless they've had a fracture, so um, that that can be a problem. Um, the other problem is that uh, once you've determined that, assuming they do have osteoporosis, uh, again the medication is not PBS reimbursed unless they've had a minimal trauma fracture. So, uh, unless you're sure that you can act on that, it's probably not worth pursuing. Not worth but the other alternative is, I mean, there is some evidence for using calcium and vitamin D. Yes. And, well, I think we should be doing that anyway. Um, I, I know this is, not, this is not perhaps the forum for this, but uh, there, is, there is an epidemic of vitamin D deficiency. So yeah. they should all be tested for it and then hopefully put on Taking calcium. Taking a therapeutic dose yeah. too. Yes. Uh, improving mobility to reduce falls. Yes. Mm. There's a good point. Vanessa? Well, I guess with Denise, we mentioned earlier that older people may not be able to use turbohalers as effectively as younger people. This is the device... Denise isn't crumbling here. She's only 63. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have no answer for that. <laughs> Um, but she may not be able to inspire deep enough to activate the turbo halo. Um, if we hadn't uh, had established that the problem was adherence, that would be a consideration mm -hmm. for her. In terms of um, the adherence due to side effects, then you'd also want to think about the device and think about converting her to maybe a puffer and a spacer mm -hmm. where she's less likely to get oral pharyngeal deposition and therefore less likely to get oral thrush. Christine? Oh, can I just um, just make a comment? And um, I was just going back to the point about doing her spirometry and um, maybe not seeing much of a change and then wondering really, is it worsening of her asthma or is it something else? I know we've mm. determined that there are adherence issues, but I was just wanting to mention that, you know, we can in, in, again, perhaps not so much in the rural area, but if you do have a lung function laboratory nearby, they can do a methacholine challenge and some sort of challenge test to determine uh, the bronchial hyperresponsiveness that may be st still present in this uh, person. And just um, perhaps of interest to people would be other tests that are a bit experimental at the moment that we hope will bring into sort of regular clinical practice such as exhaled nitric oxide as a measure of inflammation and also sputum eosinophils again as a measure of inflammation can be helpful in patients where you're trying to determine is it flaring of their asthma, mm. the lung function is not changing very much or is it something else, for example vocal cord dysfunction, mm. we've got some problems with uh, oropharyngeal candidiasis and that can also mimic asthma. What about influenza vaccination? In, some of in this lady, uh, I think that we would be recommending it and the, gu the guidelines recommend it. Let's go to our next case study. The Irene is an 85-year-old woman with a confirmed diagnosis of asthma. She's uh, pretty stable and salmeterol 50 micrograms and fluticasone 250 micrograms BD and uh, short acting and salbutamol as, sh as required. She lives independently near her daughter and uh, her daughter's family. Her mobility is limited and she's mild macular degeneration. Vanessa, take us through what you think she just come back for a routine checkup. There's nothing changed. What, what, what are the issues here for someone that uh, we could justifiably call elderly? <laughs> um, I guess the first thing to note is that she seems to have adequate control on the treatment that she's taking, which is um, pleasing to see. But the other things are to, that can be highlighted in terms of her management is that she's got mild macular degeneration, and that will have an effect on her ability to use the different um, inhaler devices in terms of loading um, medications and um, loading the spacer etc 
And the other thing is her decreased mobility and that may have some effect on her, um, her strength as well and her ability to activate the different devices. So those things would need to be reviewed and um, considered. The other thing to think about with Irene is, is, she, is um, she is an older person with some macular degeneration and in terms of her management or self-management for example we'd need to consider things a little bit differently. We did mention earlier in the program that the mortality rates among older people is, are increasing and we've very effectively been able to reduce mortality in Australia over the last 20 years. But that highlights that maybe there are some things that we need to do very differently as people age because our approach may not be working as um, effectively. And action plans are a major component of um, treatment for people with asthma. She might not be able to read it. But this is right, with a macular degeneration, a written action plan might be ineffective for her. Um, the size of the font that people are given um, action plans for is a problem in older people. And there are some groups that have developed written action plans using large fonts um, to try and um, avoid that problem. However, with her, we would need to involve her family members in terms of her management. She does have uh, daughter nearby who um, who may be involved in regular follow-up with her and assessment of how she's going so I would want to involve her in her action plan and simplify the plan as much as possible. I'd also want to assess Irene's um, needs and see what the biggest problem is for her in terms of her breathing disability and see how we could effectively improve her management based on um, achieving a better outcome for her and really making it a person-centred approach. Gary, in your practice, who gives the patient education? I do. Um, I would almost invariably involve uh, an asthma educator. Um, I think it's, it's virtually impossible to manage any chronic disease, um, be it asthma, diabetes, um, COPD, without the involvement of allied healthcare professionals, um, the pharmacist. Um, it is a team approach. It needs to be a team approach. It needs to be an ongoing, regularly, regularly reviewed uh, program. It's not a set and forget. Um, so whilst I might educate the patient, um, they will get more information, they'll get reinforcement of the information, say from an asthma educator. And we know that retention rates in a consultation are very low. We're talking about of the order of 10, 20%. So much of the information does need to be reinforced, does need to be repeated. Um, and in a country time, presumably, you just find whoever you can to actually, whoever's available in terms of professionals to, to yes. bring that on. And I would imagine that in most country towns, at the very least, you're going to have the GP and the pharmacist working together. So, Christine, what's the role of spirometry and, say, pulmonary rehabilitation in someone like Irene? I was just wondering that myself, Norman. Um, look, depending on how disabled she is, but uh, as you were suggesting, Vanessa, she, she's come along, she seems to be reasonably well managed. So I think that um, I would like to see all patients with either COPD or asthma having at least had some spirometry at some point in their uh, management process mm. so that we know where we are and uh, depending on her um, access to a pulmonary rehabilitation program if her daughter's able to take her I, I know that it would improve her quality of life and her exercise capacity so I'd certainly strongly be recommending both of those things. Question from rural New South Wales um, what's the current thinking on the amount of marijuana smoking needed to cause COPD? How many bong years are we uh, talking about here? <laughs> I don't know how many bong it's a good years. Question, yes, question, it is. Though, no, it is. I think this must be from the north coast of New South Wales, actually. <laughs> from the look of the um, phone we're, we're, we're seeing more and more patients presenting with COPD who have really nasty um, cystic lung disease. Um, marijuana use, uh, there have been a, a couple of recent. So the aging hippies are coming home to rest? Well, it really is very severe. The, the, um, the CT scans or the chest x-rays and CT scans are really quite characteristic and uh, as you know it's also it's quite difficult for these patients to to stop using uh, and often the marijuana is obviously mixed with nicotine and it can be it's a really it's a difficult management situation but we are seeing quite a lot of it. And uh, rhinitis treating the nose with nasonex to help the asthma? Yes. What is nasonex? Excuse me. Mermetazone. Mermetazone. Right. So it's another, another nasal anti corticosteroid. Right. 
And are there COPD plans like asthma plans? Yes, there are. And uh, looking at the Australian Lung Foundation website, there are uh, plans available. Now, um, the uh, Cochrane meta-analysis suggests that the use of these plans isn't quite as uh, helpful as, as they have been in asthma, but I suspect that we just don't have the evidence about them. And, mm. and talking about a holistic approach and a self-management approach uh, to management of either of these diseases, I think that it just makes common sense to, to use, to, to have a patient understanding and using some sort of a plan, for example, for flare-ups of their COPD. Mm. So what are your take-home messages, Vanessa? Um, I think one, one of the take-home messages is, are that the needs of older people are quite different, um, that we do need to define an integrated approach to the management of older people with either asthma or COPD and um, look at like changing our approach to be more holistic. Tony? I have to agree with that and I particularly think it's very important in a rural area because the limited number of health professionals there are in that area need to work together and for pharmacists it's, I think it's really important that you get to know who else is working, who else is in your area. But the other thing too is that I think pharmacists have a huge role in um, medication uh, compliance and adherence so I think we have a, a probably a more complete record and potentially in country areas where there may only be one pharmacy in a town they'll know everything that person's taking so there needs to be very open communication with the prescribers. Gary? Yes, er er errors in medicine are generally because of not looking rather than not knowing and so I think uh, we would certainly want to encourage greater use of spirometry and and, and particularly in rural settings where you may not have access to tertiary institutions, uh, performing office spirometry can be very effective uh, in, in helping to tease out what's going on with these patients. The other thing that's been mentioned already, and, and, and I would like to reinforce, is the team-based approach. And this is an ideal situation for the use of a GP management plan and team care arrangement. And GPs are often uh, pressed for time and and, um, and, and in, where, where you do a GP management plan and team care arrangement, you are getting uh, adequately remunerated for the time and effort spent and you're involving uh, ne the, the, the necessary um, uh, allied health professionals, pharmacists and so on. Christy? They've, they've said everything, haven't they? I was just going to say, um, I really would suggest that uh, people have a look at the COPDX guidelines. I think they're very useful. Uh, so the first step in those guidelines is to confirm the diagnosis. So reiterating the importance of doing spirometry. I think it's very hard to treat someone properly if you don't exactly know what you're treating. It may be mixed disease, but it's important to know that and educate the patient. Thank you all very much indeed. And I hope you've enjoyed tonight's program on breathlessness in the older adult. If you're interested in obtaining more information about the issues raised tonight, there are a number of resources available on the Rural Health Education Foundation's website, rhef.com.au. Don't forget to complete and send in your evaluation forms and please register for CPD points by completing the attendance sheet. Our thanks to the National Asthma Council of Australia for making the program possible with funding from the Australian Government's Department of Health and Ageing. But thanks to you for taking the time to attend and contribute. I'm Norman Swan. From all of us, bye for now. Coming up on the 16th of September is a live broadcast, Open Wide, Oral Health in the Bush. Following that, on Tuesday the 30th of September, we'll have a repeat of our program on tipping the scales, preventing childhood obesity. Don't forget, for any further details about the content or schedule of upcoming programs, log on to rhef.com.au.